Welcome back, everyone. It's great to see you, Meredith, and we're looking forward to what you have to say to us today. So we'll just turn it right over to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Marsha. Uh, it was a pleasure when you invited me to come talk about new ways of engagement in a new season. Um, I'm with the Lake Institute on Faith and Giving. Uh, we're part of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, and we're excited to get to think about giving from all kinds of different perspectives, uh, from the perspective of economics and history and sociology and theology. And at Lake Institute, we're particularly attentive to the ways that faith influences how people give and why they give. Uh, we conduct a good deal of research. Um, we're grateful to have good partners at Giving USA just down the hall, uh, conducting educational programs, including the Executive Certificate in Religious Fundraising, which is uh, being piloted now as an online course, uh, and certainly trying to build up public conversation about uh, what giving means uh, for faithful people these days. Uh, with the invitation to come talk about new ways of engagement, um, uh, my first instinct was to say, wow, you know, there's really nothing new under the sun. Uh, volunteer engagement, uh, donor engagement is still fundamentally about relationship building. And it's still fundamentally about offering something meaningful, something even holy. Uh, stewardship is discipleship, as everyone today has been reiterating, and as all of you have experienced in your own context. What we do with our money and our time, with our lives, it's the literal embodiment of what we believe. Stewardship work is ministry work. Uh, and so in this strange new season of ministry, I want to posit that the great news is that people in a season of isolation and upheaval, uh, people with questions of life and death on their minds, people who have a thirst for justice and peace all around us in our communities, what our congregations have to offer or what they should be offering in terms of relationships and meaning has never been more in demand nor more in need. I uh, wanna offer a few resources as we think about new ways of engaging people. Um, we want to think about who we're trying to engage with as we begin. Um, this is the constituency model. It's from our partners at the School of Philanthropy, the fundraising school, who are leaders in secular fundraising. But I think that it's useful for congregational leaders to take a moment now and again and think about as if we were just regular nonprofits, what would we need to be thinking about? Uh, this model is a way to think about who we're trying to engage. Um, we are doing stewardship of members, uh, but also there are other constituencies than simply our church members. With this model, uh, starting at the bottom of the list or the center of the circles, uh, the model helps us think about who is closest to our organization who is most closely connected to us, knows our mission, is living out our mission, uh, people who are super engaged. And then in the layers moving out from there, uh, in those concentric rings, who are the people who are less engaged? Uh, and those may be individuals as you're thinking about your congregation, but here we suggest thinking about segments of different constituencies different groups of people who connect to your congregation in different ways. Uh, it can be a really useful exercise to try and map out who are those constituencies and what is their relative uh, engagement level with our congregations. Uh, especially in this changing season, we may have some hidden constituencies that we haven't previously been thinking about. Uh, there are people who are passing by our largely empty buildings, looking at our signs or our lack of signs? Is there a way that we can use our real estate 
even while we're not present in the buildings necessarily, to still be engaging constituency members like our neighbors. Uh, there's also, with an increase in our social media presence, our online worship, what about the friends of our members who observe our members interacting with us or uh, reflecting on what we've been doing? That's another point of engagement. Are we offering ways for folks to engage beyond just the members, just the people who we are aware of? This is also a time for us to notice the ways that uh, some of our segments of constituencies may have changed because of the pandemic times. Uh, preschool parents, people who connected with us through support groups, um, people who connected with us through ministry outreach. Uh, there are folks who may not be worshiping with us, but who are still a part of our constituencies. How are we engaging with them and allowing them to engage with us? Uh, another resource that I want to share comes from secular fundraising uh, is these principles of how you engage with people who are thinking about donating their time, their money. Uh, the LAI principle uh, is a, a chestnut of fundraising technique uh, looking at linkage. How are people connected to our organization? Uh, what do they who do, who do we know in common? What do they know about us? Uh, what do they think of us? The linkage between them and us. Uh, their ability to give of their time or money. Um, people's time frames have changed a great deal uh, in this strange new season. Some folks lost their commutes and have a lot more time on their hands. Some folks have taken on full-time education of young children in addition to full-time jobs and have much less time on their hands. Uh, the ways of people have an ability to connect with us will affect how they can engage with us, how we can engage with them. Uh, and then of course, their interest in engaging with us. Uh, we are in a season of high disaffiliation from religion at large. Uh, there are, uh, as, as we've discussed already today, large swaths of people who have no particular interest, they don't think, in connecting with a faith community. How we can help boost that interest is another way to think about engagement. Uh, the companion principle to LAI is LIA. Once people are connected to us in some fashion, what do we do with them then? Uh, and the answer is to continue to build on their linkage to us, their connection to us, their relationships with other people who are a part of our congregation, with leaders in the congregation, uh, their understanding of what it is that we do. Uh, increasing their involvement. This is a tricky one at this season of, of the separation from in-person worship because, of course, it's difficult to invite people to some of the things that we're used to inviting them to. Uh, this is high season for Vacation Bible School, and it is not happening. So how else are we engaging our neighborhood children or volunteers who really love to connect with sharing their faith in those ways? What are the translations we can offer for different kinds of involvement? Uh, and then finally, advocacy. This is something that we don't always think about, uh, except that in church world, we often call it evangelism. Uh, how are people who are connected to us advocating for the congregation or for the things that we espouse, the things that we value and believe in? Uh, this is another way that we can help people think about how they are building their engagement with us. Um, I want to suggest that as you're looking at all the segments of your constituencies, all of those uh, concentric circles, how are your attempts at engagement building on one of these principles um, of building linkage and interest, maybe even ability to connect, um, as we've done in trying to go online with more of our opportunities? Um, how are we building their involvement or their advocacy? What are we doing to empower them to connect with us in one of these ways? Uh, this can help give some shape to how we're thinking about um, what we do. And in a season where we might be kind of overwhelmed with all the many tasks, 
might help us winnow down what it is we actually have to do, what will be the most effective. Uh, thinking about what kinds of engagement matter the most uh, is really important in this season. Uh, and I wanted to bring this study conducted by uh, Dr. Barbara Fullerton. Uh, she worked in the United Church of Canada, where uh, congregations' uh, financial disclosures are much, much more um, public and open uh, than they are in the United States. And so she studied congregations that were thriving financially. And then she worked to reverse engineer them and to think through and, and do some ethnography to figure out what they all had in common. Uh, and she came up with these six best practices that they all had in common. Let me say the congregations that she studied had on average an 82% per capita increase in giving over six years, a really significant um, increase in giving. And it wasn't because they were in boom towns. This was per capita. This was because these were practices that engaged people to really work in stewardship. Uh, number one, uh, as you see here, operational management. This is always essential. Uh, clarity of mission about what we are about as a congregation, effective communication of that mission, uh, realistic and faithful budget planning and communication, good governance, financial transparency, financial controls, all of those kinds of basic operational management system things do matter for people being willing to engage with us and able to engage with us. Uh, in these times, I'd wanna suggest first of getting your website in order, making sure that that give button is clear and easy and a one-click operation as much as you possibly can, uh, that you're sharing your narrative budget and telling people where the money goes, what the impact that your, their gift might have through your congregation. Uh, other things in operational management, uh, invitations to give in email and in social media forms. If we are used to relying only on Sunday morning passing a plate, then we are missing out now when there's no plate to pass and no one to pass it to. Uh, also, letting people know that you take their gifts seriously, uh, working on our digital giving operations to make sure that they're secure and to communicate to people that we value their digital security as well as what uh, their intent is for their gifts. Uh, Finally there, I want to suggest that thanking is a particularly important piece of this work. Um, how we might uh, increase what we do to thank our members and our donors uh, and to help them know what's happening um, in catching them being generous in some good ways. Uh, this shades into a couple of other best practices, but uh, one to leave here for now. Um, in Fullerton's research, operational management alone was not sufficient. Uh, it did not alone uh, serve to build up stewardship engagement. In fact, without these other practices, strong operational management practices, in fact, decreased giving. We want to make sure that the, that operational management is integrated with other forms of stewardship. Uh, first, integrating stewardship into worship. Um, for a lot of us, passing that plate had become sort of ritualized and uh, not the most uh, engaging piece of what we might do. Uh, this is our opportunity to, as we've said earlier this afternoon, tell the stories um, and take the opportunity to invite people to connect their faith life and their worship really and truly to what they're doing to give. Uh, we want to also make sure that our preaching and teaching is connected to our stewardship engagement. Um, so many of us have such limited um, experience in actually preaching sermons that are beyond just that October series about giving. Uh, in the National Study on Congregations Economic Practices, we have discovered that people uh, teach about giving a great deal less often than they, in fact, ask for gifts. Um, we see that 43% of congregations are teaching about giving on an annual or less basis. Uh, 
we can do better about teaching about what the value of generosity is in our congregations and our tradition. Uh, stewardship formation is incredibly important as we again think about so many people having been disaffiliated from religion, of folks not knowing that there is a real joy in giving, um, of not necessarily having discovered how much this matters. Uh, the, here is an opportunity for positive reinforcement, for catching people being generous and uh, inviting them to continue that work in meaningful ways. Um, sending real notes in the mail uh, helps us to praise the behavior that we want to see more of and helps people to grow uh, in being intentional uh, stewardship disciples. We know that approximately 40% of uh, givers in America to religion or any cause give impulsively. Uh, how we can offer them opportunities to do some of that impulsive giving, but also to uh, continue to grow their practice to make that a more intentional uh, aspect of their discipleship. Uh, stewardship leadership matters here. And here is where that diversity of experience and thought matters so very much. Um, how we help people to uh, step up into leadership who see generosity in really different ways. Uh, we have different generations of givers, um, as we've discussed today, and also folks who simply give in really different modes. And our leadership teams have to be broad enough to encompass all those different ideas about giving uh, and those experiences so that we can invite people uh, to really connect meaningfully with giving through our congregations. Uh, spiritual nurture opportunities matter a great deal. Um, how we can help people connect their growing maturity in faith with what they do with their time and their money. These are questions of real discipleship and not simply of business operations or of obligation or of duty to the church. This is a place where we want to help people connect with their prayer life with their moral identity, uh, with what it truly means to be a generous person in all the aspects of their lives, uh, both in the congregation and well beyond it. Uh, here is a place where a number of congregations work on financial literacy. Uh, and that's a, an important gift that a congregation can offer to its constituencies. Uh, to fill in those gaps of uh, personal financial management that people haven't learned uh, or simply need support and help to live into, but also how we connect that to those deeper practices of, of faith, of where our scriptural understanding uh, meets our wallets, uh, where our prayer life comes to, comes to rest in what we believe and do. Uh, and finally, the last best practice that Dr. Fullerton observed was engagement with peace and justice work. Uh, as much as that may be controversial in some congregations, folks don't want to engage with a congregation that is not paying attention to the important questions that are on their hearts and in their lives. Uh, congregations certainly come out to some different answers about what they might want to do with those questions. But it matters that the congregation is willing and able to engage with these questions. Uh, this might feel a lot. Um, my, a number of my colleagues who are serving in parishes have observed that uh, pace is important and that exhaustion is real as you're trying to engage in the best practices and uh, become video production engineers and do all of those things all at once. And so I would want to turn to uh, a principle of abundance. Um, heard this from Dr. Williams absolutely as well. Uh, this sense of abundance, a sense of there being enough. Um, my colleague here in Indianapolis, uh, Reverend Mike Mather, wrote this great book, um, Having Nothing, Possessing Everything. But I love this quotation reminding us to look to where we're alive. Uh, if I might reference uh, Jurassic Park, life finds a way, and engaging people in the places where life is uh, abundant in our congregations 
is the place to start. Not with our deficiencies, but with what we have, what, what can we do to connect with all the different members of our different constituencies uh, in their different approaches to generosity. Uh, we have some opportunities at this point. Uh, I will look forward to getting to be with you in the Q&A uh, to get to talk some more about some of those experiences that you've had uh, and ways that we might uh, go even further into it. Thank you very much, Meredith. What a great presentation.